planning this summer to show a brand new piece shot in 2012 and 2013. It's titled The Enclave and it's the culmination of my work in the Congo. And it's shot on 16 millimeter infrared film, color infrared film. It was used uh, in, primarily as, uh, for camouflage detection and it was designed in collaboration with the US military in the 40s, early 40s during World War II. Um, and this special technology was able to register infrared light, which is invisible to the human eye. It uh, is reflected off the chlorophyll in green plants, healthy green plants. Thereby, they were able to identify the enemy hidden in the landscape. Kodak discontinued it in 2009. And then I thought, well, where should I take this ludicrously palleted bubblegum pink film? And I thought for a while, and I thought, well, I've never been to the Congo. 5.4 million people have died were being killed of war-related causes since 1998, and that's, that's a ton of people. But we don't really hear anything about this ongoing humanitarian disaster. So it, in that sense, it's this hidden, unseen um, problem, this unseen conflict. And so I was, I was fascinated then to bring this film, which, which registers the invisible, and makes visible the unseeable, um, to bring that to a place which also it was a metaphoric leap, of course, but it was, in my mind, it was a way of sort of trying to bring these two things together and just see, see what would happen. My work is not at all a reaction against journalism. Rather, I am an artist working in places, destinations where journalists also find themselves. The first journey uh, uh, we took into the bush in 2012 and when we were starting to make the enclave was deep into isolated pockets of, of North and South Kivu to visit very, very remote rebel groups who were far beyond the infrastructure of the United Nations, for example. So there's this, this sort of Hobbesian state of war where everyone's got their back up and for the last several decades the people have been living in this cycle, sort of a nightmarish cycle of, of uh, vicious little wars. This is a really opaque place, which is really sad, um, but nobody really knows anything about them. They don't really want to try and understand them because they're so uh, intangible. So I became interested in this thing that you can't photograph. It's always the problem for me, <laughs> the impossible photograph. That's really what, what's at the heart of my work, really. For the Enclave, it's become a deeply collaborative process. Brought together um, Trevor Tweeten, who's a very talented uh, cinematographer, and Ben Frost. He's a minimal um, composer, electronic composer. This thing's like really a very aggressively intuitive art making process. So really we're just rolling with the punches, which is kind of part of the game in Congo. You can't you can't work any other way. One day we had terrible trouble um, getting started. We hadn't gone that far out of Goma. We got maybe 20, 25 miles up into the hills and um, we stopped in at a refugee camp, an IDP camp, internal displaced person camp. And um, our fixer started talking to somebody on the side of the road and he said there had been a massacre up ahead. The, there were six killed uh, the day before, actually, uh, but they were brought on foot to, to the town to be shown to, to the governor. Um, and the, uh, they were all women and children. Uh, um, the women had been raped before being killed with machete or spear. It, it's hard to really communicate that, that horrific trauma through, through that imagery. What we decided to do with, with the footage of the burial um, is to, to edit those scenes together in the six screens installation, um, along with um, a house, a wooden house being moved by hand through the streets of Goma. Um, and it, to me, it spoke of uh, internal displacement, fleeing violence. The Congolese rebels that we visited had a very interesting reaction to the camera. It was very ambivalent. They were, at the same time, deeply defiant. They didn't want to be photographed. And they made that very clear. Um, so it was this aggressive sort of face-off with the camera. Not with you, but with the lens. But at the same time, they were posing. The rebels became very gestural and performative, very expressive in their, in their poses. But it wasn't just posing, it was they were in their actions and then their, they became extremely self-conscious. And they were striking these very macho postures. So there was this, this oscillation or a play between um, deeply vulnerable yet deeply sinister 
And I think that that's interesting when you look at the picture later, at least for me. The subject of the photograph is reminding the viewer of the author's presence because they're like staring straight back at you. Of primal imp importance to me uh, is beauty. Uh, beauty is the sort of one of the main lines to, to, to make people feel something. It's the sharpest tool in the box. And if you're trying to make people feel something, if you're able to make it beautiful, then they'll sit up and listen. And often if you make something that's uh, derived from human suffering or from war, if you represent that with beauty, and sometimes it is beautiful, that creates an ethical problem in the viewer's mind. And so then they're like confused and angry and disoriented. And this is great because you got them to actually think about the act of perception and, and how, they, how this imagery is produced and consumed. In the Congolese work, I'm not even doing through beauty, I'm just doing through a color, through the color pink. People are so offended by the color pink, it's just a second color. Like, honestly, like how much more constructed is a pink photograph than a black and white photograph? Robert Capa was a black and white photographer man, but we don't see him black and white. But no, no, that's closer to truth, the capital T. In that respect, it's, it's really about using the, the potential of contemporary art, the faculty of the sublime, the ability to make visible what's beyond the limits of, of language, and to bring that to the ethical burden of bearing witnesses to the documentary.